When historian and Pulitzer Prize winning author David J. Garrow decided to write a book about Barack Obama, he made a decision that would essentially dominate the next decade of his life. The result is a massive, almost 1,500 page look at the life of the 44th American president. It's entitled Rising Star, The Making of Barack Obama. And we welcome David J. Garrow back to TVO to find out more about what it takes to write such a massive tome. Uh, we've had our two conversations about the content of the book, but I actually want to write, uh, excuse me, ask you questions about what it is like to write a book that, I mean, camera, can you see this? Can you, you can see how, are you ready for this? You can see how big this book is. When you first embarked on the project, did you know that you wanted to take a decade and write something this big? No. I first started uh, reading Barack's memoir, Dreams from My Father, uh, in early 2008 when he won the Iowa caucuses, the first step in the presidential candidacy, uh, because I knew so little about him. And I spent the balance of 2008 and the beginning of 2009, when he's inaugurated, simply reading all the biographical journalism about him. But the more I read, the more disappointed I was. Why? That reporters were incurious. They, they weren't asking what I thought were the most probing questions. And they frankly weren't doing enough legwork in terms of talking with people from uh, early in Barack's life. I first went to Chicago at the end of March 2009 uh, to speak with the community organizing mentors uh, who had hired Barack when he uh, moved to Chicago in did, 1985. Did, did you know at this point that you were doing research for a potential book? No, I knew I was going to write something. Okay. The first day in Chicago, Greg Galuzzo, the most important of the, the late 1980s mentors, said to me, oh, you should go see Marianne Wilson, uh, a tax lawyer who had incorporated their community groups, done the legal work, the paperwork, and tax lawyers saved their files. Uh, so a morning or two after, I'm, I'm there in this high rise uh, uh, in the Chicago Loop, and Miss Wilson brings out this old manila file folder. Um, and among the documents in that is a, a list typed up by Barack himself in 1987, listing everyone who's in his community group and the, the pastors. Hmm. So all of a sudden, I had a list of about 40, 45 people, uh, of whom only maybe three had ever been found by journalists, uh, to go look for. Um, and that's when I really started focusing intently uh, on those uh, first three Chicago years, 85 to 88. Um, four months after that, um, I had one of the uh, University of Chicago PhD students who was working for me. Uh, I asked her to go to uh, the big library at the university and see who else was living uh, at Barack's address um, because it was known in the journalism that he had lived with some woman during those years. But for all of, of the bizarre curiosity that people had about where was Barack Obama born, uh, questions that have very simple, obvious answers, mm -hmm. uh, no journalist had ever gone looking for this woman whom Barack lived with. And all it took to find who this woman was was to pull the student directory off the dusty shelf in the library. Uh, and so I emailed uh, Sheila Yeager um, at her, you know, uh, college address in Ohio, uh, she immediately wrote back. Um, and that, you know, easily opened up, you know, this whole other side, uh, completely unknown side. Mm, whole chapter of his life no one knew about. Exactly. Right. And that he didn't want people to know about. Right. For reasons you tell us in the book. Uh, did you at a certain, okay, so eventually, obviously, it, you, you decide this, well, I've got enough here for a book. At, was there any point at which you got concerned that the thing was starting to get bigger than a normal book might be? The big decision for me in expanding this was when I realized I had to do the Springfield part of his life. You know, the, the years he spends as a state legislator, uh, which really covers from 1995, 96 up through 2004. Um, and Springfield, as, as the capital of Illinois, several hours drive south from Chicago, is, is a world unto itself. 
Um, and making that decision to start interviewing in Springfield, I knew I was committing months and months of, of legwork in that. But I realized then that I had to go up through at least the 2004 Democratic Convention speech that uh, first brought Barack to, to national fame. Uh, but my method as a historian, going back to my, my big book on Dr. King and, and even my two books before that, um, has always been that if you're a good historian, you interview everyone you can who was there. Um, and not just the, the bold-faced names. Um, in, in doing my book on Dr. King, I learned very early on, uh, you interview the church secretary. You interview the church janitor. Yeah, because you never know. They might give you yeah. a beautiful and, nugget. And people with, a, with, with so well-known a public figure as Barack, the people who oftentimes have the most precise and clear memories of an interaction with him uh, were people who might have dealt with him only a few times, mm -hmm. not someone who was a friend who spoke to him, you know, several times a week for sure. years. But the King book was, was what, 800 pages for yes. the King book? Well, this one's well over 1,000. Yes. So at some point, does your publisher say, uh, Dave, um, does that I, happen? I was very open to the question, to the option, uh, of making this a two-volume book. Um, and the publishing house I was speaking with at that time, which I'll politely leave unnamed for the moment here, uh, told me very bluntly they had no interest in a two-volume uh, biography of Barack Obama, uh, even though they're in the midst of publishing a three-volume biography of Joseph Stalin. <laughs> you thought uh, that's a bit inconsistent. Right, okay. so I thought. Um, and that's what led me to HarperCollins. Um, and HarperCollins has, has, as I think we can both see here, uh, done a phenomenal physical job with this book. I'm, I'm extremely proud of, of how solid and attractive it is. As you should be. It's a, I mean, it's a beautiful piece of art in some respects uh, on its own. But at some point, I mean, as you point out, you've interviewed everybody. What makes you think that the public, that the people who will pick up this book, want to know in excruciating detail that much about not just his life, but the times in which he operated? My attitude as a historian is that I am not working for the reader, I am obligated to the historical record. So I view this book, uh, like my book on Dr. King, uh, like a long history of Roe v. Wade, the abortion case that I wrote some years ago, I view my role as producing books of record. My goal is not to write a bestseller. Um, I had multiple editors say to me, oh, we should trim this down. But that's not my role as a professional historian. Um, if I don't do several hundred pages uh, on Barack Obama's life in Springfield as a state legislator in the late 1990s, early 2000s, it's not going to be done. Uh, because in all the nine or ten years I spent doing this, uh, there was nobody else on the trail. And therefore, those witnesses to all of that history die, and that oh. knowledge is gone. Yes, there, I, uh, there are already at least uh, 10 people um, whom I interviewed uh, five, six, seven years ago uh, who even now are no longer with us. Hmm. Let's do a couple of minutes here on how you actually write. Longhand or computer? Oh, no, computer. computer. But the crucial, the crucial thing to say about what a scholar like me does uh, the challenge is in taking and organizing your notes. Mm. Um, How many hundreds of thousands of pages of notes? Um, I had one big file called Obama Notes, <laughs> not very surprisingly, <laughs> that with almost no margins uh, was about 3,500 pages. Um, and that was everything because you have to sort of know not only what you need and what you don't need, you also have to know, have I already re read this yes. three years ago? Yes. Do you write at the same time every day? Yes. Um, this took about 18 months nonstop to write, uh, mm -hmm. literally without a day off. So nonstop meaning you wrote something every day? Oh, yes. For a year and a half? Yes. Saturdays and Sundays as well? And 
Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> okay. um, I started in September of 2014 and finished in February of 2016. Now, needless to say, you are in the midst of a bit of a competition. Well, I wouldn't. I, I, I don't think of it that okay. way. Okay, but and I shouldn't say needless to say because I am saying it after all. But uh, you know, David Remnick is out there with his work, and he thinks he's one of the official chroniclers of Barack Obama's life. David Marinus is out there. He's written about previous presidents as well. Um, you've gotten into a bit of a food fight with those guys over sort of who's got the best book on Obama. Uh, what do you find problematic about their takes? Um, the David Remnick book, which came out in 2010, uh, is a very solid piece of work, especially for someone who has a, a day job mm -hmm. uh, editing a weekly magazine. Um, there's no question that, that David Remnick uh, is, is uh, uh, very, very supportive uh, uh, of Barack Obama uh, back then uh, in 2010 and, and nowadays as well. Um, I got a very, very nice email uh, from David Remnick back uh, earlier this year after he'd read uh, the Harvard Law School chapter uh, in this book. You did not get a very, very nice email back from David Marinus. Um, in fact, may I, may I quote? <laughs> well, with, with, with Mr. Mar Mr. Marinus... Hang on, hang on. Uh, I, gotta, I, gotta, okay. I want to put this out here first to set this up because um, he posted this on Twitter. We'll say this once only. David Garrow, author of New Obama Bio, was vile, undercutting, ignoble competitor unlike any I've encountered. Okay, I want to know the story behind that. Um... I think the story behind that is some people, as with President Trump, uh, act out on Twitter. Um, he says, encountered. I've never met or spoken with Mr. Moranis. Hmm. So I have, a, you know, uh, it's a very Trump-like uh, posting. The guy's been flaming you too. Well, you're not on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. So I don't, you're not no. flaming him there. Um, you get some bad emails back and forth? No. No contact whatsoever. No contact. So what's, what is this reference to, do you think? I do not know. There are, I believe, two paragraphs uh, in the uh, epilogue of this book um, where I quote uh, Sheila Yeager, uh, Genevieve Cook, um, a number of people in terms of their, uh, how they uh, were dealt with by Mr. Moranis. Um, the, and so Obama's I, girlfriends. Right. Um, and I quote from several reviews of the Moranis book, but it's... Uh, it's a pro forma paragraph and a half. Hmm. Um, why people act out on social media, that's, that, that's, not part of, that's, that's not part of my responsibility as, no, a, as a scholarly but historian. Did you try to get a hold of Marinus, though, and ask him, what's that all about? No. no you're going to no. let the sleeping dogs lie. Okay. Uh, let me finish up on this, and that is dealing with the president himself. Uh, you met with him. You met with him for eight hours in the White House. He went through the manuscript. He, you obviously wanted him to... Uh, you know, to consent to having a tape recorder roll and get some comments on the record, and he ultimately said no. How come? Uh, I never expressly asked to tape it. Um, my decision was that I thought the polite human thing to do, since he was clearly still alive, uh, was to offer to let him read this. I just thought that was sort of good manners. So you I approached had, them, and, and he was... I was already in touch with, with his people, um, and I made that offer. Uh, would he like to read it? And I wasn't necessarily expecting that he, he would, uh, but he did. Um, we had an introductory uh, meeting in the Oval Office for about an hour and 20 minutes uh, in uh, April of 2016. Uh, no one else was in the room. Uh, very intense conversation. And he agreed then that uh, he'd read the manuscript. And so uh, it was delivered to him in, in hard copy, you know, printed out. Mm -hmm. um, he spent dozens and dozens of hours uh, reading it, uh, August, September of 2016. Uh, I went back to the White House uh, for the second uh, meeting in, in October of 2016. Uh, we spent over three hours uh, in the private dining room, uh, which is a small space just west of the Oval Office. And Barack had uh, chapters one through four there in, in big you, binders. You didn't call him Barack. No, you were with no, him. no, okay. no. Okay, okay. Just but, I, but I mean, I, I speak of him as Barack throughout the book yes. because that's who he was yeah. before the presidency. So uh, I, I find it uh, 
overly formalistic to, to call him President Obama every right. time. Um, and so he went through and told me what he'd marked up in chapters one through four. And then, uh, you know, he's out busy campaigning for uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, and so I went back uh, for the third uh, long conversation, another three hours. Uh, I believe it was December 4th um, after uh, the election of his successor. And we went through from chapters five up through chapter 10. And in a nutshell, what did he think of the book? Uh, he had mixed feelings. Um, you know, these were, you know, uh, officially off the record, so I'm not supposed to directly quote him. Uh, there were many things uh, in it that he liked uh, and a number of things in it that he objected very strongly to. But after reading a thousand pages on one's own life, I presume you would love him to have said to you, Dave, you got me. You, you nailed it. Did he say that? Again, I'm not supposed to oh, quote. You're not supposed Let me, to okay. the, the thing I should say, Steve, which I, I think is, is significant, um, Barack Obama believes intensely in a complete separation, a complete compartmentalization between one's public life and one's private life. Um, is there anything about his political life in this uh, that he believes is incorrect? I don't believe so, but I think it's highly surprising and unusual that someone could become president of the United States and expect one's personal relationships prior to marriage uh, to remain secret and off the record for the balance of one's human, li one's human life. Well, if he was under that impression, you've certainly blasted a hole through it in this book because it's all there in black and white. Uh, I, I want to thank you again for spending so much time with us here tonight on TVO. Uh, we did part one, part two, and now this on the writing of the book, which, while huge, is an absolutely fabulous piece of work. So congratulations on Rising Star, The Making of Barack Obama by Pulitzer Prize winning author David J. Garrow. Thanks, David. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.